title of this conversation, the subtitle of Conversation with a Mystic. That's only for you. I'm not conversing with a mystic, so I'm at ease. <laughs> That's my job. That's my job. Got it. <laughs> I know, and I have many questions, you know. <laughs> Sadhguru said, I've never seen someone with so many questions. He said, no answers, only questions. Um, I think the, the, the subtext, which I actually am talking about because I liked it, is an experiential, for today, an experiential symposium on optimal health and well-being. And I think there's a tremendous amount for us to talk about even in that phrase. One is the role of experience. And, and I will say that, um, you know, my office being responsible for cultural transformation, I've become obsessed with what is culture. And the definition that I use because it guides our strategies is behavior, this definition was given to me by Admiral Grossenbacher, is behavior, either collective or individual behavior, based in experience and incentives. Meaning that if we're going to transform or shift what medical, the medical model is today and what healthcare is today, we can't start with just the data. If people do not have an inner experience, not much will change. Do you, can you say some about what you think the role of experience is in today and in healthcare? So you need to understand this. Largely for most human beings, experience is being kind of created and regulated by the way they think and feel. But what you think and what you feel need not necessarily have anything to do with reality as such. There is something called as a psychological reality and there is an existential reality. By controlling or handling the psychological reality well, a lot of people can become healthy, a lot. Because for a lot of them that is the cause of their ailment. And it can also fix other things to some extent. So, psycholo like right now uh, Mitch was talking about you know, somebody prays and somebody creates a certain attitude around them of love and care and compassion. This is all psychological structure. You create a psychological structure with which you become open to certain dimensions of life. You… it becomes a possibility to transact in a certain way with least amount of friction and creates well-being. But there's an existential dimension to this. Existentially, what are you made of? What, are, what is the world made of, if you look at it? This is the most fundamental aspect of yoga. This is called as Bhutha Shuddhi. This means elemental, cleansing of the elemental nature. The whole universe is a manifestation of five elements. So is this body. Out of these five, there are only four that you can really handle. Another one you just experience, it's the ambience for the other four. So the earth, water, fire, air and the space. So you only have to handle really four. With four ingredients, so much magic and mischief is happening in the universe. If there were four million, we would be <laughs> not able to handle it. Four for sure we can handle, isn't it? Four ingredients, if they're functioning the way you want them, then everything about you will be great. Out of these four, seventy-two percent of your water, I mean is… your body is actually water, so is the planet. The same composition of the planet you have in your body. About twelve percent is earth, about six percent is air, four percent is fire, the remaining is space. This is how it is looked at. If you master these four, even if you have a bit of control over these four, you will see miraculously you will generate health within the system. If you fail on this, then the next level of handling this is Nature has evolved certain things in the form of herbs and very things, many things which are helpful to us, so we can learn to use them. If you fail in that, then you can create a psychological structure which will create health for you. If you fail in that, then you go for the chemical treatment. If you fail in that, then you go for a surgery. So well, that's the escalation. <laughs> Direct intervention of cutting something, putting something. If nothing else, you're capable of doing. But now you're talking about a large-scale thing across the populations. We always think anything subtle cannot be done large-scale. I disagree with that, this is my opinion. 
<laughs> because uh, it is just that we have not done enough work towards that and we assume that it's not possible. To create a certain sensitivity towards something and approach it in a subtle manner is possible but it's only possible if it goes into every home, every parent, every man and woman in the… Uh, in the world or in the country starts working towards it. When you want such a big goal to be achieved, it's not going to happen overnight. We must be willing to be committed for a whole generation or two, then something will happen. Something wonderful will happen. But right now we are in today's world, everything has to happen by today evening. If it doesn't happen, tomorrow we dump it and have a new project going. So in that context, it will not happen. In that context, it's bet better we work towards a plastic heart and a plastic liver and a plastic kidney where we can start replacing them every five years and somehow function. See, health does not mean that just the medical parameters are okay. Health means you must feel a sense, certain sense of wholeness. The word health itself comes from that word whole. A certain sense of wholeness, when you wake up in the morning, you are more alive than you are when you went to bed, you feel ten years younger than the time when you went to bed. If you feel like that, that means you're healthy. It is just that all the tests are showing you're normal, that is still not normal because you have no experience of health. So when you say experience, ultimately we have come here only to experience life, isn't it? So we know that experience is the most important aspect of life. Now we're talking about the word experience in two different ways. One is our experience of life itself, how profound and how wonderful it is, or how nasty and how unpleasant it is. So the pleasantness that we generate in the body, we call this as health. Right now, that is the object of discussion, I don't want to go further, but the same pleasantness, if it hits a higher pitch, we call it pleasure. But if your mind becomes pleasant, you would call it peacefulness. If it becomes very pleasant, you would call it joyfulness. If your emotions become pleasant, you would call it love or affection. If it becomes very pleasant, you would call it compassion. If your very life energy, if you make it pleasant, we call it bliss. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. This is what a human being is seeking all the time. He wants pleasantness inside. Well, if your surroundings become pleasant, we call it success. This is what every human being is looking for all the time. There is a whole science as to how to create the inner pleasantness. External pleasantness needs cooperation from many people. It's not just yours, the other stakeholders who may want to make it nasty for you <laughs> It needs many people's cooperation, but inner pleasantness is one hundred percent yours. But why have we not strived for it? We have not strived for it because generally we have spread this message, it is not possible unless everything in the universe is fixed. When I first came to the United States, one word I was hearing everywhere is stress management. I could not understand this because in my mind, we manage things which are precious to us. Our family, our wealth, our business and whatever else which is valuable to us. Why would anybody want to manage stress? is something I couldn't get for some time <laughs> It is just because we've spread the idea that stress is a part of your life. Stress is not a part of your life. Stress is not because of your job. Stress is simply because you do not know how to manage your own system.